Well, good morning. Good to see everyone this morning, ready to uh, have another great day in the Lord's house. And I'm excited for what the Lord has in store for us today. Well, let's get started. Our first song of the day, This Is My Father's World. Let's all stand and sing this great old hymn. Page 29 in your hymn book, if you want to use that. Otherwise, we have the words on the wall. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world. start this morning our next song draw me close Yeah. 
singing this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to you this morning, God, just thank you for loving us. God, thank you for um, being the one that never leaves us. God, your word tells us that you will never leave us nor forsake us. God, just help us to uh, internalize that. Help us to understand that you are always there for us. God, you're the one that we need to run to anytime life gets difficult. God, I just thank you for that. We're so undeserving, but God, your love is never ending. Your mercies are new every day. God, so thank you for that. God, I pray that you would just bless our time here this morning. Be with our pastor. Give him the words to say. And God, may we have a heart to hear from you this very day. God, we love you. Thank you for it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our next song, What a Mighty God We Serve. Get your hands ready on this one. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God. What a mighty God we serve. Some of you are very uncomfortable, but we got through it. It's okay to clap. They'll get used to it once they get to heaven. <laughs> don't worry. I don't like it either, but I do it just because. All right, Here I Am to Worship is our next song.
singing this morning. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church. We are glad to have you with us. Hopefully you grabbed a bulletin on your way in and inside that bulletin is a connect card and if you would be so kind to fill that out that just gives us a record of your attendance and we do pray that you receive a blessing for being here today. Well, are there any birthdays this week? Do you have a birthday this week? Really? Lucas has a birthday? Well, happy birthday. We'll get him a candy bar. Anyone else have a birthday? Somebody's being pointed out over here. <laughs> you at least accept a chocolate bar and give it to your pastor. Anyone else? What about anniversaries? Any anniversaries this week? No? Kim, you also have an anniversary this week? Well, happy birthday and anniversary. Makes it very easy to remember. How many years? Eight years. Amen. <clears throat> well, later on in the service, the offering plate will come by, and so you can put your tithe and offering there if you so choose, or you can go online and give gracebaptistherlock.org. Uh, also, don't forget to uh, place your Connect card in the offering plate uh, when that comes by, just so we can... Uh, have your feedback. Well, take your Bibles out and stand if you are willing and able. Romans, the book of Romans, in chapter number 12. Romans in chapter number 12, as Christine reads for us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies the living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith, for, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then, then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. 
Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Thank you, Christine. You may be seated. Take your bulletin out and let's prepare to tear out our Connect card. Bend it back and forth a few times. Get ready to tear that out. Are you ready? Uh oh, I heard an early tear. Really? All right, one, two, three. All right, the Lord lays something on your heart this morning. You can write it down on this Connect card and putting in the plate when it comes by later on in the service. Well, it's children's church time, so you young ones can gather up in the back. And Hallelujah. Have a great time this morning. Who's that strange man in the back? Well, no, he cut all his hair off. If you're going for the Nazarite vow, you're failing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. A lot you're of the failing. Kids are getting ready to go for camp. One more week. All right, Pastor. Thank you, Tony. We want to say hello to, their, to those who are worshiping with us online this morning. Uh, we can't, well, we could name them all, but I'm just going to name a few of them. Michelle Alexander, the Zimmermans, the Nash family, the Waltons, that's Kenny and Christine, and Joy Rimbold, and there are others as well. We appreciate those who uh, assemble with us online when you can't be here uh, when you're under the weather, whatever uh, is going on traveling, we're glad that you connect as best you can. Just remember that worship and assembly with the saints is not a spectator sport. That's, that's true for those of you who are here in a seat as well. All right? Um, the closest thing Christianity comes to a spectator sport is God performs and we celebrate while he performs. But uh, be worshiping, uh, be discipling others, be fellowshipping with others, serve in some way, share the gospel with others. Whether you're at home in a recliner or sitting right here, this is what we are as a church. So make sure that you're uh, engaging in all of these ways. Otherwise, we're not fulfilling our purpose. And life without purpose is meaningless. We're continuing our series on the book of Romans called Racing Through Romans, and I hope this has been a blessing to you. It's been a tremendous blessing to me, even though I've um, written through the book of Romans and taught through the book of Romans before. The attempt to do it in five weeks was incredibly helpful uh, in solidifying some of the great points of this book uh, in my heart and mind. I hope the, the series has been a blessing to you. I'll try not to preach too long because... I hear Steve Hutchins brought a bunch of homemade cantaloupe for the picnic today. And uh, somebody fried a turkey, isn't that right, Mr. Barry, I believe? And uh, smoked some uh, pork. So we got some pulled pork. And uh, I, I made two peach cobblers, one with homegrown white peaches and one with homegrown yellow peaches. And they're hot. They're sitting there on the counter. Just pulled them out of the oven about 25 minutes ago. So if you have trouble listening today, I understand but I'll try not to preach too long and get out there and, uh, and uh, have some of that. Even if you didn't plan to stay for the picnic today, we, we welcome you to stick around. Uh, if you're not a member and you want to come to the business meeting, you're welcome to come to the business meeting, or if you just want to stay for the picnic and, uh, and then leave before the business meeting, that's your choice as well. But we certainly want everybody to stick around, and we can sweat together, right? It's going to be a little bit warm and humid out there. The grass is still wet. So uh, it's that time of year. Enjoy it. Snow will be here soon enough. 
Y'all remember this day, July 31st, when you're shoveling snow in December, right? You remember this day. Let me review real quickly what we've covered so far. The first week we talked about our great need. Our great need is to realize that we are guilty. And remember that Paul introduced us to the heathen and to the hypocrite and to the Hebrew in chapters 1, 2, and 3. And the truth is, many of us really fit all three of those categories. I know I do. In Paul's mind, I'm among the heathen for sure. Um, but the hypocrite is someone who pretends like they're doing the right thing, but they're not sincere. And they're actually doing other stuff that's contrary to what they're doing on the outside. They're doing other stuff on the inside or behind their back when people aren't watching, so on and so forth. And uh, I'm not always sincere. How about you? So, yeah, I can be a hypocrite. So he's, written, he's writing to me. And the Hebrews, the reason he specified them is because they had the law of God. And I've had the law of God all my life. So I kind of fit in all three categories. Uh, three strikes, I'm out. I'm guilty, guilty, guilty. And that's what the uh, first section in Romans is about. Then we talked the second week about God's generous provision. He has simply given you his righteousness. It's just a gift and all you do is receive it. And you put that robe on, really, he puts the robe on you, and he sees you as perfect. Uh, we'll see the gospel rainbow here at the end. I think that's what I'm going to call it, Tony, the gospel rainbow. Uh, here at the end with the colors of black and red and white and green and blue and gold on both ends. Um, after the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from our sin, we don't just say, hey, look, it's white. We're forgiven. We're innocent. We're clean. We also say, look at the green. We have eternal life. He hasn't just said, you're not guilty. That would be enough to keep us out of hell. But he has said, you are as good as my son, Jesus Christ. That gives us access into heaven. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. And that, he's just given that to you. You haven't earned any of it. He just said, here is yours. And it's to all of his children. We are, we are all heirs with Jesus Christ, God's generous provision. Then the third week we talked about freedom. We're truly free in Christ, truly free, not free to sin, although technically that's the truth. If that's what you want to do, it'll cost you, but uh, we're free from sin. We don't, we don't have to listen to the flesh. We don't have to listen to the world. We don't have to listen to the devil. He, God has set us free from all of that. And uh, truly, Romans tells us we have victory, we have uh, everything we need to triumph in Christ if we will simply avail ourselves of the Spirit's leading and the tools that he gives to us. We are truly free. And then uh, last week we talked about this question, who's on first? So if you think about the direction of Paul's letter in the book of Romans... You're guilty, 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 guilty. God has given you forgiveness and righteousness. Now you are free in him. Then he kind of runs into this parenthesis and says, now don't forget about God's chosen people, the Jews. God's still got a plan for them. And God's going to use his grace upon you to renew their interest in him. So don't forget that that was our past and that's what's coming in the future as well. So we talked about Israel and the truth that we are the true Israel of God if we have the faith of Abraham. So it doesn't matter that you're not kin to Abraham. It doesn't matter that you weren't born in the Holy Land or something of that nature. Uh, if you have the faith of Abraham, then you're the true child of God, the true Jew, according to Paul's writings. It doesn't mean that, he, that God's done with national Israel or ethnic Israel. He's still got a plan for them. But uh, we are princes and Princesses, is, 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 I'm not sure how to say that one, uh, in, uh, in Christ. So today, I want to talk about this, that new car smell. How many of you know what I'm talking about, that new car smell? If you, now not so much anymore, they don't even put the little popping cigarette lighters and ashtrays in vehicles anymore, but... Most of us can remember when every car came with a pop-out cigarette lighter and every car came with ashtrays in them. And sometimes in the 70s and 80s, you would buy a vehicle, a used vehicle, and you get in it, and you could tell they sprayed something. They sprayed a lot of something to try to cover up what was in that car, but somebody had turned that car 
into a furnace, right? And it smelled like cigarette smoke, and it didn't matter how long you drove it. You could run the windows down, leave them open all the time. You could always smell that. You know what I'm talking about? So they try, and there's even a spray that you can get that's new car smell, but it wouldn't cover up that smell, right? I've left my windows open on my truck, and it's been rained in before. And then, of course, you roll them up, and then the sun starts doing its thing, and you open it, and it smells like somebody forgot laundry in the washer three weeks ago. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, oh, my goodness, I'm just going to rip all the carpet out of here. We'll, I'll just sit on a bucket. I don't need these seats anymore because it stinks so bad. But that new car smell, when you buy a new car, I thought about trying to get Preston Ford to just bring a car and park it outside that door so y'all could get up in the message and go smell the new car. That new car smell, believe it or not, do you know what it comes from? It is called off-gassing from adhesives and sealants that they use to construct all that stuff on the inside. So that doesn't sound so good, does it? I remember when, when we moved in the parsonage, there was a warning on the counter about, um, what do you call that stuff that they, that they put, in, uh, put in your body when you die if they're going to turn you into a mummy or for, yeah, had this warning about formaldehyde. I'm like, great, I'm moving into a casket here, and uh, it's going to have formaldehyde all around me, and I'll be ready for my grave before I get there or something. Uh, but in your car, if it's a new car, it has that new car smell, it's actually not a pleasant concept to think, well, I'm just sniffing glue. <laughs> it's just a bunch of sealants and so forth, adhesives. But it is pleasant to us for a reason, right? We associate it with the newness of that vehicle. So maybe you hate the new car smell, but most of us, we would want our car to smell like that because that would mean it's new, right? But what about for the believers, the followers of Jesus Christ? We read in the scriptures that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, Behold, all things are become new. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And if I could pause from the message just to explain a little bit about this newness, there are degrees of newness. There's different kinds of newness, even in the Scripture. There's new, new, different kinds of newness when it comes to cars as well. You might say, I got a new car, even though it has 20,000 miles on it, right? But it's new to you. You know what I'm saying? So the word new even has different meanings for us. But certainly, if I could get into prophecy just for a couple of minutes real quick, after the tribulation period, after Jesus comes back and the world goes to pot for real, and then Jesus returns again um, to set up his kingdom on this earth, he's on this earth, but he renews this earth, and he has to renew this earth. Because if you know anything about the tribulation period, all the mountains are shaken until they disappear because of the earthquakes. All the islands sink into the sea. There's no economy at all at the end of the tribulation period. There are no governments left at all. There are no militaries left at all. Um, there's, what else is there? There's, no, uh, there's one other thing that I've forgotten. Uh, there's no religions on the whole face of the earth, no organized religions at all. So, and think of all the destruction, you know, with all the green things that have been burned up and all the devastation that's happened on this planet. So we enter the millennial reign of Christ, the, the kingdom age, on the tail end of that, and yet it's here on this planet. So he's going to have some refurbishing work to do. Y'all agree with that? Does that make sense? So there's a newness in the new age, in the new kingdom that's coming. There's a newness, but it's actually still the same old earth. It's just refreshed. It's renewed. And you've experienced this yourself. Before you came to Christ, you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. You had no life in you at all. Now you have new life. John chapter 3, verse 3, you must be born again, right? The new birth experience. Well, you've been born again. You're a new, cre new, new creation, new cre creature in Christ. But are you perfect? Okay, your spouse is saying, no, he's not. No, she's not. Your kids are saying, no, my parents are not. And certainly parents are saying, no, my kids are not. Well, are you a new creature or aren't you? Well, it's kind of like that newness of the millennium. Satan's going to show back up at the end of the millennial reign. 
He's going to gather some fresh rebels and try to lead an attack against the Messiah one last time. But then God's going to destroy this planet completely, and he's going to create from scratch brand new, a new heaven and a new, a new earth. That's a different kind of new. Are you with me? And there will be no perishing. There will be no curse. There will be no pain, no tears, all that stuff, all the sorrow, all of it's gone. So there's different kinds of new, and you also will someday experience a newness that's a different kind of newness, a full newness, when you're resurrected, when you're in your resurrected body, right? But we don't have to wait till the resurrection to experience this new car smell, okay? So here's what I want you to do today. I'm going to give you some indicators some people are really good. Mr. Bill does this. He listens to music, and he says, mm, I, I hear a banjo. Of course, he hears a banjo in all the music he listens to because it's always bluegrass. But he says, I hear a banjo, right? I hear a mandolin. I hear a guitar. I hear a bass. Whatever it is, right? I hear a drum. I hear a, since it's bluegrass, I hear a, a jug. <laughs> uh, whatever. I hear a crosscut saw that somebody's yanking on, okay? I hear horns. Some people can do that with smells, right? They, you cook something, they're like, oh, I smell a little bit of, and they tell you some of the things that are in there, whatever spice you put in it or, you know, whatever. As a believer, and I don't, I couldn't imagine anybody would know the new car smell so well that they would be like, oh, that's an epoxy, and <laughs> I doubt anybody would be that good at that. But as a believer, there are unique uh, aromas unique as in different from the world, that God can sense in us. The Bible speaks very plainly about us being a sweet savor, a sweet aroma to God as we live our life, okay? And to each other, right? So there's some indicators that you should be able to say, here, smell of me. Okay, don't do that to people. Don't ask them to smell of me. Here, smell of me. Do I smell like a Christian, Right? We're not talking about actual, actual odors, okay? We're talking about spiritual traits, spiritual characteristics. And Paul closes this book in chapter 12 through 16 with four specific aromas that make up the new Christian smell, the new car smell for the Christian. I'm confident in these. I, I'm not up here speculating. I'm not, you know, I think he's talking about this. They're just plain as day right in these chapters. You, you can't escape these truths if you read these chapters with an open mind and I believe enlightened by the Spirit. I'm not saying these are the only odors, spiritual odors, spiritual aromas that the Christian produces, but these are the ones that Paul focused on. So I want to take you through all these chapters real quickly and then we'll try to go back and look at some details because chapter 12 is an amazing chapter. I hope you picked that up as Christine was reading it. Maybe if you were really paying attention, you were like, I thought we were done with the Ten Commandments. Now he's given us 40 new commandments, right? It's, isn't that that way? Christine is like, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. It's like, what? I thought we were done with commandments. So we'll get into some of the details of why and what that's all about. Let me say it this way, by way of illustration to make it clear. The law of Moses or the law of God, the Ten Commandments and all that's attached to that, was given, of course, to the Hebrews, and they couldn't keep it, and nobody can keep it because you've got to keep it perfectly. You might keep it from time to time. You might keep some of the rules, but you don't keep them all. So it's like, I'm not speeding, but I don't have my seatbelt on. Well, he can still pull you over, right? Well, I got my seatbelt on, but I'm speeding. Well, he can still pull you over. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not speeding, and I got my seatbelt on, but I don't have any headlights, and it's midnight. Well, he can still pull you over. So you've got to do it all right all the time. Otherwise, you're not acceptable to God. Well, that's ridiculous. Am I right? Who can do that? Certainly not me, right? So we get out from under the law, and now we're under grace, which is called the law of liberty, or the law of love. And now there's a whole bunch of new commandments. And it's like the old one's stricter. Okay? But now he gives us the energy, and we serve in the Spirit by grace through faith, not through self-effort. That's the difference. So if you take this new law, we'll call it a Ferrari, the grace of God. You take this new law and you take the old Volkswagen Beetle engine out of the back of the Volkswagen and you somehow adapt it and try to run this Ferrari. The old Volkswagen engine is self-effort under the Ten Commandments. 
I will not kill anybody. I will not steal. You know, I will not covet. I will not do this, that, and the other thing. And I will remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And I will honor my parents and all those things. You had a Volkswagen engine trying to run in an Indy race, you know, and you're like, I quit. This ain't never going to work. But when we try to do this new stuff of Romans chapter 12 with the old strategy, it's like taking that old Volkswagen, sorry, I got into my German, Volkswagen, got my old Volkswagen engine, Beetle engine, stuck in this Ferrari. Is that going to work? Is that for Ferrari going to behave like a Ferrari? No. You might pitter-putt down the road and people say, well, you're making some progress. But that is not God's ideal for you, and it's not his idea for us. So let's, get, let's go through these chapters. I really want peach cobbler. That's why I'm talking so fast. <laughs> How many have I cooked now? 29 peach cobblers this spring. I love them. Now, Romans chapter 12 we see the first aroma, the first aroma of the Christian is sacrifice. Now, our flesh does not sacrifice willingly. Your flesh will sacrifice. Your flesh, that's your nature. That's who you are naturally, just because you're a human. Okay, you're a child of Adam. Just who you are, you're born this way, right? We don't sacrifice naturally. My old pastor used to say, we get all we can, can all we get, and sit on the lid, okay? That's what we do in our flesh. It's gimme, 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 and that's mine, and keep your hands off of it, okay? We're not prone to sacrifice. Now, we can learn to sacrifice even in, under the law of Moses or even in our flesh. There are people who do not know Christ who do know how to sacrifice, and it's because of the positive rewards that God has built into existence, those who learn to sacrifice do reap the benefits in this life, even if they don't know Christ. You with me? So, if, you, if for example, if you're a lost man and you're, and you're in line, you know, at a restaurant or something, if you're a lost man and you give somebody else a place in line, hey, you can get in front of me because you feel sorry for them or whatever else, well, they might do something nice for you. They might buy your meal. You with me? So, there can be a... a a learning process whereby a lost person learns to sacrifice because they like the reward, okay? But for the believer, sacrifice comes natural, I should say supernaturally. It comes supernaturally by the Spirit even when there is no perceivable reward in this life. It's like when Paul said, I, will gla I would gladly die and go to hell for my ethnic brothers and sisters, the Jews. It's like, what? What? There's no benefit in that, not for you. That doesn't even make sense. But that's the aroma of the believer, sacrifice. So he says, and I can quote this. I think I can quote it. I tried Isaiah 55, 7 last month and bombed terribly. But I think I can quote part of this chapter because my father preached from this passage so much. Okay? I beseech you, therefore, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy sacrifice holy sacrifice, acceptable unto God, acceptable sacrifice, and this is reasonable. In other words, it just makes sense. Jesus gave up his position in heaven to come down to where we are, to be one of us. He gave up his glory temporarily to come be with us. He gave up all kinds of things, especially on the cross. He literally sacrificed his body for you and me. So surely if he asks you and me to, to be a living sacrifice, that's a fair demand or expectation or request. Amen? So he says, sacrifice. And he even tells us how to do it, which is where we got this message. By the renewing, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In chapter 12, verse 2, I believe it is. The renewing of your mind. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know him as your Savior because you repented and placed your faith in Jesus Christ. The word repent means to get a new mind, to get a new mindset, to get a new perspective. You were an enemy of God. You saw that he wants to be your friend, that he provided for friendship between you and him, and you put your faith in Christ. You turned from your sin to the Savior, and he forgave you and gave you eternal life through the work of Jesus Christ, through the blood that was shed for you. But now as a believer... You still struggle with sin. Can I get a witness? You still struggle with sin. So do I. So he says you have to be constantly renewing your mind. You open that new 
Ferrari with that Ferrari engine in it, Patrick, your Christian life, and you open it up and say, hmm, new car smell, this is awesome. And then I've shoveled horse manure before. You shovel some horse manure in there. That's called sinning. And then God and the believers around you, and maybe even yourself, you notice it, right? We do become nose blind to some things, don't we? You ever been around somebody that was nose blind to their body odor or something or their bad breath? And you're like, oh my goodness, I'm going to die, right? We become nose blind to our sin. It doesn't stink to us, but trust me, it stinks to God. And that new car smell is gone. And we're not sacrificing, we're being selfish. Now listen, as I said concerning the, the Volkswagen Beetle engine and the Ferrari, you can't muster this stuff. You can't say, well, then I will sacrifice, therefore God will love me. It doesn't work that way. You've got your cart before the horse, right? You just got to get on your face before God and say, I'm not sacrificing. I know I'm not. My flesh is too strong in evil things and too weak, completely anemic and impotent, in godly things. You're going to have to take over. Keep that Ferrari engine in there, okay? and he'll help you get that horse manure out, and you can sacrifice, all right? So sacrifice. Are you a sacrificial person? Okay. When are we supposed to be this way? When we gather with believers? Certainly. When we're at work? Certainly. When we're alone? Certainly. When we're at home? Certainly. Sacrificing, sacrificing, and that theme is repeated through the rest of the book. If we have the Spirit in us, we will willingly sacrifice for God and others. A living sacrifice. That's what the new car smell looks like, if I could say it that way, for the believer. Sacrifice. That's chapter 12. Then chapter 13 is all about submission. Okay? We all like to be told what to do, right? Somebody boss me around. I love having people tell me what to do. Especially I got three or four bosses at the same time telling me different stuff to do. I love that, right? No, that's the definition of stress, right? I want to be my own boss. I don't care if it takes me 10 times longer. I don't care if it's 50 times harder. If I can do it and be my own boss, that's the way I want to do it. Anybody else that way? A few of you. But when the Spirit takes over, we happily, willingly, eagerly submit to Him and to the people around us which is also sacrificial. Submission, not my way. He specifically says in verse 1 of chapter 13, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. Well, he paints with a broad stroke, doesn't he? Who's the higher power? Well, if you're a student, it's a teacher, right? And the principal. If you're a teacher, it's the principal. If you're the principal, it's the, whatever, the local superintendent of education or the board of education or whatever. Uh, if you're a, a child, it's your parent, right? You may not like this, but the Bible says if you're a wife, it's your husband. If you're a husband, it's Jesus himself. If you're a citizen, it's your governor or your president or the local policeman or the traffic cop or the judge. All power. He says, submit to those who are in power. Well, I'm a rebel. Okay, well, repent. <laughs> Apologize for your evil attitude and Learn to submit. Well, I'm just a maverick. Fancy way of saying, nobody's going to tell me what to do. Well, I'm just kind of independent. Okay, well, you've, you've took some new car smell and sprayed it in that vehicle, but there's still a pile of horse poop on the back seat. <laughs> and you've got to get that out of there. And it might cost you a back seat, right? Submission. I don't like submitting. But the Bible says in the church we are all to be submitting one to another in the fear of the Lord at all times. I can't tell you how many believers over the years have basically said to me, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. I want to say, have you even read the New Testament? What are you doing here? You enter into the covenant of Christ by submitting to Christ. That's where we start, how we get in. So if I'm not submissive, then I have to say, that new car smell's gone. I want it back. 
And again, you can't muster it. You can try real hard. You can do the Flintstone thing, you know, but you ain't going to perform like the Ferrari engine of God's grace and the Spirit of God in you. That's chapter 13. It's all about submission. So sacrifice, submission. Chapter 14. I'm dropping stuff here. Chapter 14 and 15, all the way up to verse 7, is about sensitivity. So follow me now. Think of the whole book of Romans. Guilty, 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 right? Guilty. Now he gives me righteousness. Now he gives me righteousness. And he accepts me because he's given me righteousness. Now I, I'm free. I'm free and he's using me. I'm a prince in the kingdom of God. And he's using me in the lives of people around me and for a greater purpose for the Jewish people, which is a mystery that I really can't even understand or comprehend. And now I'm, I'm different, right? I'm, I've partaken of the divine nature, as it says, and I'm a child of the king, I'm a child of God, I'm a citizen of heaven, so I'm different. What is, what is different? I'm sacrificial now. I sacrifice willingly and eagerly and naturally and sometimes don't even realize it. And, and I'm submitting and I'm gladly uh, reaching out to other people who can pour into my life and tell me, hey, this is the route to take, this is the way to go. And I'm like, thanks for the direction. I appreciate that. And I, and I accept it and I move forward and I'm sensitive. This is chapter 14. Beginning in verse 1, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. And we'll skip over the whole thing because I don't have time to go through it right now. Down to verse 7 of chapter 15, he concludes with the same point. Wherefore, receive you one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now, he deals specifically in chapter 14 and 15 with people who have a weak conscience and people who have a strong conscience. We have a tendency, and if you're really churched, if you're saturated in churchy stuff, then you're at a disadvantage because we categorize these things immediately as soon as we hear them, okay? You hear somebody has a weak conscience, and you think, oh, they're, they're not a good Christian. That's not what Paul says. Oh, they, but they got a weak conscience. They must be a weak Christian. One thing for sure, in Romans chapter 14 and 15, he is not saying those with an instructed conscience are great Christians, and those with, with a weak conscience, they're lousy Christians. That's not what he's saying, and it's not his point at all. His point is that all of us have a conscience that is instructed to a different degree, and there are so many circumstances that come into that. For example, if you got saved last week, <laughs> as opposed to getting saved 50 years ago, you would expect there would be maybe some difference in the way those two, peop those two people's consciences work. That was a bad sentence. You, you follow me though, right? And it's based on personality. It's based on what the preacher's been preaching in your ear for years and years and years. What he's preaching here is sensitivity. That is the person who has the instructed conscience. Let me help you out with what I'm talking about. The one who has an instructed conscience in Paul's story specifically, they could eat meat offered to idols and it didn't bother them at all because they knew that the idols were not real. They knew there were no real gods behind those idols. There were certainly some demons, but they knew there's only one God. So if you hold up a stake and say, ah, we worship you, you know, God of uh, Redskins football, you know, we worship you with this red stake, you know, and no, there's no redskins anymore. So, but anyway, <laughs> if you, but there's no God up there listening. You with me? And the meat's the same meat. So the guy with the instructed conscience can eat the meat. He's like, it doesn't matter. But the guy with a weak conscience who hasn't been instructed, it still bothers him. He can't get over this association, probably because he used to do it and actually believed it was a false God and so on and so forth. So he's like, man, that's not right. I can't do that. Now he's talking about something in his day. We got other issues in our day, and none of us are arguing over whether we should eat meat that's been offered to idols or not. Nobody in here is having that conversation at all. But we argue about other things. Is this right or is it wrong? Okay, so we'll argue about how often you have to come to church. So in this section, the guy with a strong conscience says, I come to church whenever the Spirit leads me to. You're like, what? Well, he leads you to come every time. Bye, cracky. <laughs> you know? The guy with a weak conscience says, if you ever miss a church service, you're in rebellion against God. You're backslidden. Right? You ought to be here every time the church doors are open. If you ever miss, 
you wicked sinner, you need to repent. Well, the Bible says don't quit coming to church altogether, that's for sure. But actually, both of them can be right, according to Paul. And both of them can be wrong, according to Paul. You're God's servant. Keep your conscience clear before God. If you can't miss a Sunday night service without your conscience smiting you, then he says, then don't miss. If you truly love Jesus, now if you're just missing because you're, you know, you don't care, <laughs> you'd rather do something else, well, that's a different thing. But if you truly love Jesus, but you're like, you know, I believe this Sunday night, I should invite my neighbors over for a barbecue. And instead of going to church, we're going to have a barbecue. We're free in Christ. And the Spirit can certainly lead you to do that. The problem is, in this passage, the guy with the instructed conscience and the guy with the weak conscience are always at each other. That's the issue. And they're all pointing at each other all the time. Oh, you wicked person. And he's like, receive those who have a weak conscience. Do you have an instructed conscience? You're like, I know we don't have to do this. I know we can do this. But all these people think we can't do that. And all the people think we have to do this. He says, don't separate and say, well, I ain't hanging out with y'all. He says, receive. Does that person love Jesus? Does Jesus love that person? Then love them. They answer to God, not to you, right? He's already done away with the law in the early part of the passage anyway. This is hard for us to swallow. Some of y'all are looking at me like, I don't know about all this stuff. Sensitivity. Realizing God helps people grow at their own pace and their own time. And what may look horrible to me may not look horrible to God and may, look, may not look horrible to somebody around me. Of course it's not an across-the-board thing. Okay? For example, drunkenness. Well, the Bible condemns drunkenness. That's not a matter of opinion. That's not like, well, I think it's wrong and you think it's right, and we can just you know, agree to disagree. No, the Bible's very plain about that. You know what it's not plain about? Whether drinking alcohol at all, at any time, under any circumstance, is forbidden. And some of you are like, oh, yes, it is. And some of you are like, that's right, that's right, preacher. Preach it, that's right. Put these people into place. <laughs> that's not the point. The point is the one who says, well, I can drink from time to time as long as I don't get drunk. And the one says, I shall never drink and nobody should ever drink. He says, these two, if they love Jesus, should be able to overlook that issue and love each other. That's what he says in Romans 14 and 15. Sensitivity. And he says, even though all things are lawful, all things are not expedient, I'll gladly give up some stuff if, if it makes me a blessing to my brother. And I'll add in some stuff if it, if it makes me a blessing to my brother. So it's actually the guy with the, the instructed conscience who ends up making the majority of the sacrifices in the passage. He does deal with, in Colossians and in verse 2, I keep getting my Bible upside down, he does deal with, you're, you're not subject to manipulation. So the one who has the weak conscience doesn't have the right to go around controlling everybody else. Okay, so, well, it bothers me, so you got to quit. <laughs> no, the word for you is mind your own business. From Paul. Okay, not from me. I don't want to say that to you. But Paul, if you'll read the scriptures, the Paul, Paul's instruction for you is just mind your own business. Okay? But his instruction for the guy who has the instructed conscience is, why don't you just make a sacrifice? So Paul said, I can eat meat, doesn't matter. Offer to idols, don't matter. I can, I can drink this, I can go there, I can do this, don't matter. But I'll never do those things if I can be a blessing to somebody else by sacrificing those things. So being sensitive, paying attention, watching people's response. Am I helping them? Am I blessing them? Am I encouraging them? Or am I running over them? Am I getting in their way? Am I hurting them? Be sensitive. That's part of the new car smell. And then chapter 16 uh, is all about service. The last, well, the rest of chapter 15, beginning in verse 8, and all of chapter 16 is all about service. And he gives some examples of service, especially in chapter 16. Phoebe, our sister, the servants, the word deacon, actually, of the church, which is in Centria. He said, receive her. Clearly, he was aware of the possibility that some might not receive her, probably just because it was a her. 
And he said, and assist her. She's in charge of this. Assist her in whatever business she has need of because she has been a sucker or a helper of many and of myself. And then he lists a whole bunch of other servants in this section. Service. Service. The flesh does not want to serve. The flesh wants to be served. But in the spirit, we are always looking for an opportunity to serve. Right? That's the new car smell. I want an opportunity and, and a chance to just get my hands dirty in the work of the Lord. Uh, there are some believers, Patrick, you and I were talking about this recently when we were talking about addiction. There are some believers who have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. They had addicted themselves to service of others. That's part of the new car smell. So if you got those down, sacrifice, submission, sensitivity, and service. These are evidences that the new life of Christ is dominating in you. Okay? Let me show it to you earlier in the book. Turn back to chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verse uh, 4. When I was younger, uh, sometimes we would hear this when, when the preacher baptized. Um, it lay, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And they would say, buried in the likeness of his death. And they would either say, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Or they'd say, raised to walk in newness of life. Has anybody ever heard that at baptism? That's very biblical. Raised to walk in newness of life. This is Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with Christ. It says him, but he's talking about Christ. We are buried with him by baptism into death. Now, it's not the baptism of water. That symbolizes the baptism. But you're baptized, according to Revelation chapter 1, in the blood of Jesus. He's washed you from his, your sins in his own blood. And we're baptized with the Holy Ghost. Remember John the Baptist said there's one, one coming who's going to baptize with fire and with the Holy Ghost? Well, that's what you were baptized with. If you profess faith in Jesus Christ and you were sincere, then you have been immersed, you've been pickled in Jesus, all right? So you've been immersed in the Holy Spirit and saturated with the Spirit. We're buried with him, symbolized by the baptism of water. We're buried with him by baptism into death. We're dead in Christ. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So you're not just saved as a fire escape, just saved so you don't miss hell. Now you're saved unto good works. You're saved to this new life in Christ. And it's, it's mentioned multiple places in the New Testament. I've already looked at 2 Corinthians 5, uh, all things have become new. Galatians 6 uh, says that we are a new creature. As I said, Romans 6, 4 talks about this newness of life that we have. Romans 7, 6 talks about the newness of spirit that we have. And John 3, 3 simply refers to it as the new birth, the new life, being born again right? And then we live in this new life after we have been born into the kingdom of God, into the family of God, born of the Spirit. So you just got to ask yourself, where am I? Do I have these, these traits? Does this stuff show up in me? When, they, when these traits started showing up in me, I was just in like sixth grade, and it shocked me. Because I'd never lived that way. I'd never thought that way. And when it came without me scheming and striving and conniving to try to force it to happen, I was shocked. But it's our new nature. So you got to ask, are these traits in me? Yes, your flesh is still there. Your flesh is still fighting very hard against all of these things. That's true. But you should, the Bible says the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. That's why we can't do the things that we want to do. Because there's a war on the inside of us, those of us who are the children of God. If you stop fighting or if you've never entered the war, the flesh wins all the time. The devil wins all the time. Okay? But as followers of Jesus Christ, ask yourself, are these traits there? Am I sacrificing? And happily so. Am I submissive and happily so? Am I sensitive? Do I care how my life is impacting the believers around me? Am I sensitive to whether I'm being a benefit and blessing to them or a burden to them? 
And am I serving and happy to serve, eager to serve? I don't know if I should tell this or not. Hopefully I don't get in trouble. I'm always doing stuff like this. Lord, is this of you? So all those cobblers have been made with junk peaches. I work for Matt Taylor a little bit on the side, and there's these peaches that are all knotty, and they've been, something's happened to them. So I cut all the bad stuff. got to learn that from my mom. She would go pick them off the ground. Okay, but take these junk peaches. And so I love working in the orchard. It's all just fun to me, every bit of it. If I never made a peach or never made a dollar, it wouldn't matter. I'd still have a great time. So I love working in the peach orchard. Well, yesterday I went out there with a weed eater to whack some weeds down out there. It was hot. I'm out there weed eating. I weed eated for so long, I've never done this, until I had blisters on my hands from the weed eater. That has the soft handle and everything. I'm out there, it's hot. I'm sweating, getting, probably getting into poison ivy. We'll find out. <laughs> Okay. I mean, no, that grass is this tall under those trees, and the morning glories are growing, growing up the trees, and I'm just having a ball. I'm just out there, and I'm listening to a book in my ears, and I'm just weeding, and the truth is I was disappointed when I was done. I was covered with grass, stinking, sweating, you know, dirt in my eyes. I don't care. I'm having a big time because that's my thing. It's one of my things. Okay? I probably, to be, to be honest with you, I probably shouldn't have been out there. I probably should have been doing something else. I probably should have been planning for camp or something, right? But I wanted to be out there. It's like nature to me. It's like natural. Just, it's just who I am, right? So if that's not your thing, you with me? If that's not your thing, you might could fake it. You might say, yay, we're going to whack weeds, you know. You get out there and you don't know how to run the weed eater, you know, you don't know how to know how to rewire it. It's out of gas, you didn't even can't even tell, you know, and you're messing up all the time and, and you're miserable, right? You could fake it, you could force it, but it's not natural. You with me? These traits, I'm not talking about faking them and forcing them. I'm talking about these traits being in your life. And it's surprising to you to see how much of this is in your life. That's when you know the Spirit's dominating. And God gets all the glory, not you. Amen? But that's the new car smell. That's the new car smell. That old used car smell, or the smoke car smell, or the crap hauler smell, with horse manure in it. Okay? That's the old man. That's the old nature. We've got to let go of those things. Amen? We've got to trade that old Volkswagen in for a Ferrari. It is 11 o'clock. I could stop right now. But then you'd wait a long time for all the food to get ready. Let's go back and look at chapter 12. We won't go through all these chapters, but I do want to focus just on chapter 12, specifically on this word sacrifice. He says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Look at verse 2. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So this is the how-to. How do I do this? Well, I need a new mindset. So maybe you've sat down to open the Bible and read the Bible before, and you're reading, and your mind's wandering, and you're like, I can't believe I'm sitting here doing this when I should be, right, whatever it is that you got on your to-do list. Or you bow your head to pray, and you're like, dear Father, and your mind wanders to something, maybe even something horrible, something evil, right? You're like, man, I need a new brain. I need a new mind. Yes, you do. Okay? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You need a new mind. How does this happen? He describes it with the word transformed in verse 2. Transformed. Does anybody have a note in your Bible telling us where that word transformed comes from? This is not to impress you. I don't know any more Greek than you do, okay? But I do have some books that I can open and look at and figure some things out. And this word is one you'll recognize. That's why I want to show you the Greek word behind this particular word. Does so anybody have the, a note in your Bible or something you scribbled in saying where that word transformed comes from? Anybody? Transfigured? That's a good synonym. It's not the Greek source. Changed, that's a good definition. But it's the word metamorpho. Ah, you know it, don't you? Metamorphosis. So the little caterpillar eats, 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 lots of leaves, and all of us farmers curse them. Right? They eat the leaves, 
And then they spin a little cocoon, I think is what you call it, and they crawl in there, and they sit, and they wiggle, and so forth, and then they come out eventually a flutterby. That's right. They come out of a butterfly, and they're so beautiful. I let my mustard greens grow until they're tall yellow flowers in my garden, and they're full of butterflies, right? Sometimes I look at butterflies, and I'm like, they have no purpose except just to be pretty, right? And you just look at them like, man, they're so pretty, right? He says, be transformed, metamorphosis. You're a worm, and that's a very biblical statement. Hell's the place where the worm doesn't die and the fire's not quenched. Without Christ, you're just a worm. Some worms are so disgusting, I don't even want to step on them, you know? It's like, I don't want that on my shoe. <laughs> you with me? I mean, I'll step on a spider, an ant, you know, a roach. That's nasty enough, but worms, you know, you step on them, and it's like, <laughs> yeah, I don't want that on my shoe. Yeah, that's pretty bad to be so gross they don't even, the guy who wants you dead won't even step on you, right? You're a worm without Christ. But once you come to Christ, metamorphosis. You're transformed. The truth is we're kind of still in the cocoon, aren't we? We're still in the cocoon. We're waiting for that full realization of the beauty of Christ that is coming in us. But he says metamorphosis. That's what need to, needs to happen. You look at the butterfly and you're like, there's no similarity. That worm was ugly. And this butterfly is beautiful, right? I read a, a book. Matt, you're the one that recommended it to me, I believe. Unexpected Choice. Yeah. I read this book this week by Patty Guybink, I believe is her name. I highly recommend it. Unexpected Choice. She was an abortion doctor with Planned Parenthood. And uh, I'll skip over the whole story and tell you she got saved and became uh, a missionary, a, a doctor doing work to save lives rather than kill people. And uh, great testimony for Christ. She actually, by my understanding of the story, stood in the legislature uh, in South Dakota and argued for abortion. And then after she got saved, she stood in the same place and argued against abortion. Pretty incredible. And if you look at her life, and if you, if you were to listen to her story, you can find her on YouTube. You can listen to her testimony, a short version of it. Um, it's like two different people. It's like their values are completely different. It's like everything about the two people is completely different. And that's what it's supposed to be. If we as believers still have the attitude of the world, I'm not talking about worldly things like, I don't know whether you buy cool clothes or not. That can be a worldly issue or it can be irrelevant. That's not the point. Worldliness is not into, you know, what brand of music you listen to. Worldliness is in contrary and contradistinction from these four characteristics and some other ones. The worldly mind is not sacrificial. The worldly mind is not submissive. The worldly mind is not sensitive. The worldly mind is not serving. You with me? But when we come to Christ, these things conquer us. And it's a wonderful conquest. And we fly his flag and say, man, this is so much better. I'm so much happier now in Christ. And the world looks at us and they're like, but, but you lost this and you lost that and you don't have that. And what's the matter with you? We're like, you don't understand. You just haven't lived in this freedom. You, you got to taste it or you'll never understand it. Okay? Y'all got to taste that peach cobbler. You'll never know how good it is. Lord, save me from peach cobbler. <laughs> so he goes through here, and he talks about all these minute traits under sacrifice. We're going to race through these, and I'll tell you which verse I'm in. You can kind of figure out where they come from. In verse 3, he talks about humility. As a believer, Christ produces humility in his children. You know, we, we, we scream and holler, at least as a Baptist preacher I do, we scream and holler about God hates pride, you know, and God hates proud look, and don't be proud, all that kind of stuff. But as we listen to the Spirit, we don't even have to worry about God hates pride because the Spirit naturally produces humility in us. Pride can't be where humility is. So he does give us these commands, as I mentioned earlier, but they're really just descriptions of what it means to walk in the Spirit. And you can't manufacture these things or do it with your Volkswagen engine. So he says, think soberly, be, humbly, be humble. That's what he means by that. And then he talks about collective thinking in verse 5. Ooh, that sounds strange. We are one body in Christ. 
all members one of another? I, there's no doubt about it. The best sermons that, that I've ever preached were sermons that I did not create on my own. And not even just me and Jesus. It's where I got with other believers and said, hey, what do you think about this? Even last night, Mark, as you and I were just talking about the simple action step, my eyes were opened. Because when I read the verse, I was like, I'm, I think I know where I'm going. And then as we talked back and forth, and then I saw where that was in John 3, and I was like, yeah, 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 that's it. Well, that's a work of the Spirit. I mean, I can't say, well, you know, God's, God's done this for me, and look at me, I'm important. And Mark can't say, oh, God, oh, look, God's given me some wisdom, I'm important. No, that's not the point. God wants us to think together about him. That's called fellowship, right? And so he, he embraces that in verse 5, uh, collective thinking in Christ. And then the gifts in verse 6, proof of this new car smell. So when we think together about Christ and, and come to greater heights in our spiritual walk as we work together, talking about Christ, thinking about Christ, and then faith is talked about in verse 6 as well, the different portion of faith. Not everybody has the same amount of faith, but whatever amount of faith you have, use that for the glory of God. Then service in verse 7. Exhortation in verse 8. Here's another Greek word worth, worth knowing. If you have a churchy background, you've probably heard the word for the Holy Spirit, paraclete. Anybody? Wave at me if you heard that before. Paraclete. Hey, parakletos is the Greek word. Well, this word here, ex exhortation or exhorteth, Exhort is parakaleo, just a different form of the same word. Paraclete means someone who comes alongside, right? So we know that the Holy Spirit does that, don't we? Jesus said, I'm leaving, but I'll send the Holy Spirit. He'll come alongside, and he actually dwells in us, but he comes alongside and he helps us along the way. So you're not alone, right? The Spirit of Christ is with you. I don't guess I ever realized that he says, we are also paracletes for each other. In other words, think about it this way. As you try to walk the Christian life, Jeff, if you're like, well, I got Terry, that's enough. It might feel that way, but God says, no, you need the Spirit too. Okay? And if somebody else says, well, I got the Spirit, and that's enough. No, it's not. You need the saints. So, so, so you need some, in fact, we see this kind of foreshadowed in the Old Testament where it says, uh, if a man walks alone and he falls, He's going to stay down. He's got nobody to pick him up. But if he has his friend with him and he falls, his friend will help him up. And then Solomon adds, and a three-fold cord is not easily broken. So you think about it. As you're trying to live the Christian life, and if you're truly speaking to the Spirit and he's speaking to you, and you're truly, honestly, transparently, with accountability, speaking to another believer who is walking in the Spirit, and the devil comes along and attacks you, you've got a real good chance of sending him running. Amen? It's when we're by ourselves that we fail. And hey, my flesh says, well, I kind of like being by myself. I mean, some of those things that I fail in are kind of fun. Am I right? I mean, your flesh is like, I mean, I don't want to give up everything. I want to serve Jesus, but let's hang on to a few of these doodads and trinkets around. And the Spirit says, no, you don't need it. Lay aside every weight, every sin which does so easily beset you, and run with patience the race that is set before you, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. And the believer beside you says, yeah, this is where it's at. And you're like, yeah, that's where it's at. And then you think clearly, Right? And then you get alone, and you don't think so clearly anymore. Am I right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I kind of deserve a rest anyway. Christ is rest. We don't rest from Christ. We rest in Christ. So he talks about exhortation. Let's, let's exhort. Some of you are specifically uh, gifted in that way. He says, love without hypocrisy. Ooh, love without hypocrisy. Ouch. Sometimes I do things that are loving, but I do them for a completely evil motive. I know what is the loving thing to do, but I do it because I know it's expected of me. Or I do it because I'm afraid I'll get in trouble if I don't do it. That's not the way the word love is supposed to work. Or the 
substance of love is supposed to work. Is it? Okay. I love my wife. I kiss my wife. Because if I don't, I'll get in trouble. What? I, 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 I'm going to love my wife. I'm going to kiss my wife because I know there are some benefits. How about just kissing her because I like her and I want to kiss her? And somebody's like, why are you doing that? Well, I don't know. I just like it. <laughs> right? How about if we serve the Lord that way? That's what we want, right? Not loving with dissimulation or with hypocrisy is the other word there. So he says, hate the things that are evil. Start with your own evil, right? Hate things that are evil. Cleave, hold on to that which is good. Then he says, be kindly affection one to another in brotherly love. This is showing deference. Now you might be saying, I don't know what the word deference means. What are you bringing out all these big words for? Okay, hold on. You do. If you're a football fan, they flip the coin at the beginning of the game, and whoever wins usually says, we defer to the second half, right? And the announcer's like, oh, the blue team has deferred. We hear that all the time. What are they saying? It's your choice. You get to pick. That's what it means. He says the believers should be living their life this way all the time. But we're like, we're like the guy on Despicable Me. Is it Gru? Is that, how do you spell that? Gru, G-R-U. I love that movie. So I was watching it just the other night as Tanya and I were doing something else. I don't remember what we were doing. We're sitting there wishing we had kids at home, I think. And we're watching Despicable Me. It's the beginning of the movie. I don't remember if it's that one or Despicable 2. And Gru walks in the restaurant to get some uh, coffee or something and donuts. And, and there's a long line, right? And what does he do? Pulls out his freeze gun and freezes them all, right? And walks to the front of the line and gets whatever's there and walks off. That's not the way the Christian's supposed to live the life. Amen? No. Deferring. Oh, oh, you, you can have the place. Here, you go first. And then somebody else can. Oh, oh, you, you can have the place. And people around us are like, man, you're insane. You're going backwards. You're never going to get your coffee. <laughs> I'm not just talking about coffee. I'm talking about everything in life. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, preferring one another. Don't be slothful in business. Be fervent in spirit serving the Lord. When I was out there weed eating, I was doing it fervently, right? No distractions. Going to do this and get her done, right? And I was having a big time. That's why we need to live our, our spiritual life with that kind of fervency. And if we don't have it, we can't manufacture it. We've got to ask God to forgive us for our selfishness and do that work in us. Rejoice, he says, in hope. As we come close, we're, we're racing through Romans here. We think of Paul the Apostle saying at the end of his life, I've I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished the course. There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. So as we run the Christian life, this marathon, and we come to the end of the race, and we see that rope or ribbon or whatever it is, the tape, and we're stretching for it, as we see that, that point coming, our hope begins to, to increase. It begins to grow. At least it should. If we're walking in the Spirit, it should. Have you ever been around a Christian that the closer they got to the end, the more excited they seemed to get about Jesus? That's the way it's supposed to be. By the way, we've met some people that were the other way around too. They get towards the end, you're not sure they ever knew Jesus. Bad sign. But as we're living the Christian life, we come down to the home stretch and we're like, yes. He says, live your whole life that way. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation, because tribulation is coming. Instant in prayer, praying about everything. Being generous, verse 13. Distributing the necess necessity of the saints. Bless those who persecute you. This sounds like Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. But we can do this in the Spirit. Bless those who persecute you. Rejoice with those who are happy. Cry with those who are sad, verse 15. Then he talks about unity in verse 16. Have the same mind one toward another. Unity, find the common ground, focus on the common ground, which is Christ. And he says, gladly step way down low to be a, a blessing to those who are low in society. Whether it's low in intelligence level or low in education or low in their finances or low in their status or whatever it is. 
You may not personally look down on them. If, by God's grace, you've got the right perspective. I hope that you don't. But if culture and society is looking down on them, then they are people of low degree or of low estate. He says, get all the way down there with them. My granddaughter was just here. And those of you who have grandchildren, or if you remember when you had your own little ones, maybe if you got a little one, you know what this is like. Think about their perspective. You know, she's this tall. Pops six feet, two inches tall. All she knows what I look like is the bottom of my goatee and up my nose. You with me? And from the time she was just a, a, a little tiny baby, if I get down on the floor with her, man, her face just lights up. Now she can slap me on the top of the head and pinch my nose, right? All those good things and pull my beard. Now I'm right down there on her level. It costs right? Get up. I'm, I can't feel my arm. You know, I was on my elbow. And now I can't feel my arm for half an hour. You know what I'm saying? Jesus sacrificed for us, getting down on our level. And he says, do this for the people around you. Do it eagerly. Do it willingly. Condescend to men of low degree. He says in verse 17, be honest, not just in the sight of God, but in the sight of men. Provide for honest things in the sight of all men. We can get so sanctimonious and self-righteous. I'm just pleasing God, doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. There's a place for that. Yes, if God is pleased and everybody else is not pleased, then they just have to lump it. Amen? But when we don't care about the perspective of others, that's a problem. Okay? So it should break our hearts if we have to disappoint and discourage the people around us because we should care what they think. That's called our testimony. So live an honest life in the sight of all men, he says. Live peaceably with all men as much as lieth in you, and the Spirit is what lies in us, of course. And then he says um, don't, don't worry about vengeance. Things are not going to be fair. As you, if you live the Christian life and you have that new car smell, you know, stinky people are going to get in your vehicle. <laughs> You'll be like, oh, this new car smell is getting lost real fast. Okay. But he is able. Amen. He can redeem anything. He redeemed the murder of his own son. Okay. To redeem, to take something that is, is wasteful, something that is lost, something that is, is of no value, something that is actually evil, something that is counterproductive, and to somehow turn it around and make it valuable and make it good. That's what it means to redeem something spiritually. God can redeem the things that are happening against you in your life, and you don't have to say, well, I'll make them pay. I'll get them back. You don't have to do that. You just love them. God will take care of the justice in his own time. He'll do it perfectly. He says, don't worry about vengeance. You just live in the Spirit. And uh, so he says, if, you're, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. Don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar. So then in chapter 13, as I said, he gets into all those who are in government, obey those who are in authority. Chapter 14, he deals with those who are weak in the faith. I think I covered that enough. We don't have to get back into that anymore. Uh, then chapter 15 and 16, he's got all these people. And uh, I'll just skip over all that as well. I think we've beat this dead horse long enough. It's one thing to know this stuff. Man, Toby, I, I love studying it. I like knowing it. That's exciting. And flesh works against that too, by the way. Man, read these chapters and look up and like, I don't know what I just read. <laughs> I guess I would start all over, right? And you read it again and kind of understand it. And then an hour later, try to think back on it. I'm like, well, I can't remember what I learned. Y'all that way too? And I don't believe that's just our natural deficiencies. I believe Satan's in there stealing those seeds. I really believe that. And so I keep going back, keep going back. And it's valuable to learn this stuff. I mean, that's important. You know the truth and the truth will, will make you free. But we're worse off if we don't actually allow the truth to change us. If the cop pulls me over for driving 70 in a 55-mile-an-hour in a zone 
And he says, here, I'm going to give you a warning. You know, slow it down there, trooper. Keep it down. And I pull right out of there, Matt, doing 70 again. <laughs> well, then I've learned nothing. And he better not give me another warning. He better give me a ticket. He better chase me down and give me a ticket. Right? I need to learn my lesson in the Christian life just because you're like, oh, well, now I know what the speed limit is. So? Big whoop. Try the speed limit. Remember, we're not talking about speed limits. We're talking about your Christian life and living in the Spirit. Okay? So you're not better off for having been here this morning. Okay? I came into this sanctuary, and I worshiped, and I'm sure God will bless me this week for it. Well, maybe, but that's not the point. Do you know my mom used to stand at the sink and wash those dishes and sing, Do you know my Jesus? Do you know my friend? Do you know him as your Savior? Are you walking with him? Raised to walk. What did it say in Romans 6, 4? Raised to walk in newness of life. Every day, people ought to open the doors of our Christian life Ferrari and go, man, this thing smells like it's brand new. Never mind the fact that you've been driving it for 40 years, some of you. Some of you have been saved that long, 50 years. You still have that new car smell. Am I right? You know I'm right. In fact, they can start smelling more and more like a new car as the days go by. That's the way the Christian life is supposed to be lived. Pray for each other. Pray for me. I want these traits to dominate in me. They don't. Sometimes they do. Sometimes one or two do. Do or does or however you say that. How about all the time? I mean, just... Jesus testified of, was it Nathaniel? Oh, a man of Galilee in whom is no guile at all. That amazes me. No deception, no, no twisting, no pretending. Can you imagine Jesus meeting you and saying something like that about you? Oh, this dear lady, she's real. She's the real deal. Can you imagine Jesus saying that about you? That's what I want. I want that kind of testimony from Christ. We've got testimonies of people in the Bible, God's saying of Job, there's nobody like Job in all the earth. He loves me. He hates evil. He'll not turn his back on me no matter what happens. I want that to be true of me. Do you want that to be true of you? Is it true of you? Let's pray. Lord, we can talk a big game. We can make all kinds of promises we can say what we are going to do what we should do what would be good to do help us to do to walk in the spirit to live sacrificially to be submissive to be sensitive about what God's doing in the lives of people around us especially through us to be willing servants eager servants Lord, may this be more than just another sermon, another series. May this be a life-changing moment for us as your children. Pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I want to give you the action step just before Brother Tony takes over. It's in your bulletin there if you'll take your Connect card out. I hope you can check this. I didn't put by God's grace. I usually put by God's grace. But let me tell you, everything good is by God's grace. Amen. Y'all, I hope you all understand that. It's not just a little phrase. Without God's goodness and God's power and God's spirit and God's work in you and me, you and I will never do anything right, never do anything good, never do anything acceptable in his sight. So by God's grace, I will embrace the new life that I have in Jesus instead of resorting to the old dead existence I was stuck in before I knew him. Don't go back to the old dungeon, to the old basement. 
living there. Don't drive that Volkswagen around or try to drive the Ferrari with a Volkswagen engine. Look to him. I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians 5.17. It tells us that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature. Yes. The old things are passed away. Those things are gone. Everything is new. Yes. What a great comfort that is. If you're not in Christ, we see the gospel flag on the wall. I like that name, the gospel flag. The sin that is in us is represented by the black. But we only get to the white pureness. We have to go through the blood of Jesus to do that. That is what makes us new. That is what cleanses us. If you've never done that, I encourage you to do that today. Yes. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that he died for you and that he rose again. And then confess your sin to him and call upon him. He has promised that he would save you. Then you will be a new creature in Christ. A new Amen. person in Christ. What a great thing. Well, let's stand and we'll sing our last song of the day, Blessed Assurance. We only have that through Christ. That's right. Blessed Assurance. house. Just a few announcements before we head out. Uh, 12 o'clock picnic starts. I'm sure we'll start a little bit earlier than that, but uh, if you are inclined to do so, stay for that. And then 1 o'clock, we will be right back in here for a, a quick business meeting. And then uh, we'll be back at 5.30 uh, to worship the Lord once again. Upward Soccer is also coming, and so if you want to be involved in that, see Brother Chad Shelley. Uh, we need a few to uh, give devotions, five-minute devotions. They'll already be prepared, uh, so you don't have to come up with those. Uh, but if you want to be involved in that, see Brother Chad Shelley. Also, Awana is coming up. And if you want to be involved in that, also see uh, Brother Chad 
Shelly about that as well. So we'll be registering soon. Uh, Awana will be starting up uh, very quickly. So um, September is not that far away. It's, it's almost August. And so surprisingly, it will be right upon us. Um, as you head out, don't forget to pick up your kids. There is some bakery in the gym. Uh, and uh, don't forget, pray for Miss Jan Bailey. If you haven't heard, uh, she's back in the hospital uh, and having some issues there. So do be in prayer uh, for her uh, that the medications uh, would work. Anything else? We have one more. She's working on it. We think we have another announcement from Chad. Chad Shelley would like to have a prayer send-off for the campers at 9.30 a.m. next Sunday morning. So if you could be here for that. Uh, the campers are showing up, what, 8.30? Yeah. Um, so if, if you want to come to, we only have the 10 o'clock. I'm glad this came up. Yeah, we only have one assembly next Sunday, 10 o'clock. No 7.30 assembly, no 5.30 assembly. So just 10 o'clock because 59 of us will not be here. 59 of us will be over in Mercersburg, Pennsylvania uh, at camp, right? So we're leaving at 9.30, and Chad would like to have a prayer send-off. So if you want to come just a little bit early, oh, early, uh, for the 10 o'clock service for that prayer meeting, and uh, we'll pray for the workers and the campers next Sunday morning. Thank you. Yes, you gave me that. I forgot it. Lost it. All right, stick around uh, for the picnic if you want to, and we will uh, meet back in here at 1 o'clock.